So for next uh, floor is to David Klee. Um, I think you can share your screen already and uh, we can see where you take us this time in your roller coaster. Thanks very much. Thank you so much. Uh, really a pleasure to talk with you all today. Can you all hear me all right and see the screen? Wonderful. Um, pleasure to join you uh, as always. I wish it were in person again, but uh, I, I'm so glad that these sessions have resumed and uh, uh, glad to have the opportunity to participate. Um, so today I'll be going through some things that have changed in, uh, in the cloud and in the world of media supply chain since we all last got together uh, in Stockholm in 2019 really focusing on, on two sides of what I have growingly seen as the same coin. What's changed in the cloud in terms of the way that archival storage works and the pricing, we, we reviewed some numbers back in 2019. I've done my best to update those numbers, but uh, hopefully not torture you with too many numbers. Again, we'll see. Uh, and then how those changes in cloud-based archiving technologies have led to tremendous supply chain growth and some really interesting things uh, that we've been doing at a &E based in New York. Um, and I guess that's where I should start to introduce myself briefly. Uh, I am based out of New York for a &E Networks. Um, uh, as you can see from the slide, I have an affinity for organizations that start with the letter A, apparently. Um, uh, most of my cloud-based work has been in AWS, where I'm AWS certified and uh, went to school uh, for a master's out in Arizona. Um, but a &E Networks uh, has been working hard to move into the cloud, and you may or may not be familiar with the brand names you see on the screen here, but the content is um, distributed all over the globe. It's translated into 40 different languages. I believe we appear in 196 different territories right now. So there's a, a good chance you may have seen the content, even if you aren't familiar with these specific brand names or channels that you see on the screen. Uh, and a quick set of disclaimers before we get going. I feel like I say these uh, most times that we get together, but at a very high level, what works for me may not work for you. Uh, your mileage may vary. I'm happy to share the things that I have found effective. Um, but again, everybody has a unique situation. So obviously do what's right for you. Um, so with that being said, let's talk about what has changed in the cloud uh, when it comes to archiving the cloud since we all got together in 2019. Um, and maybe first, what hasn't changed? And the, the same three market leaders are still really leading the public cloud charge. Um, AWS first with, uh, by most estimates, roughly a third of the cloud-based market. Um, Microsoft Azure as second and Google Cloud as third. Um, that was true in 2019. That continues to be true now. Um, but what's interesting is the the growth in public cloud spend. Since we got together in 2019, by all estimates this year, we're going to more than double the public cloud market since 2019, the amount of money being spent on the public cloud. Um, public cloud has really, I think, continued to grow very quickly, partly fueled by the pandemic and everybody looking for new opportunities and new tools, and partly because a lot of technologies have really become uh, ripe for these new workflows. Um, so these providers do a ton of things. I'm only going to focus on one of those things today, and that's storage. And even within storage, there are many different types of storage offered by these cloud-based providers. Some are much more expensive, but much more high performance. Uh, and then others are less expensive and lower performance. And object-based storage, this idea of a, a bucket, a more or less cloud-native way to store your files, is I think really the right point. That's where I hear most media organizations talking about storing their content in the cloud. That's what we tend to leverage as the long-term storage in the cloud. So within the wide world of all the things these cloud providers do, I'm gonna focus almost exclusively on object storage today, as I think that's most appropriate for this archive discussion. And even within object storage, there are many different tiers to sort of review very briefly some of the, the topics we talked about last time. Um, within object storage, you still have the price and performance trade-off. The most expensive tiers of object storage are immediately accessible and higher performing and the least expensive tiers of object storage, these archive classes all the way on the right of the screen are uh, often the absolutely the least expensive, but you often have to wait and pay an extra retrieval fee in order to get your content back out of them. In many cases, that's like, um, think of using your old LTO tape library to restore content, it might take some time. 
Um, so there are lots of trade-offs within these tiers and the cloud providers let you utilize these tiers and move things around based on policies that you set. So you get to do what's right for you and for your workflows, as long as you put in some thought and planning around what makes the most sense. So back to the public cloud providers, all three of these major providers provide what I would consider storage across those tiers, object-based storage across those tiers. This is where we were in 2019, where um, AWS had just come out with Glacier Deep Archive, which was at the time the cheapest, lowest cost, but also would trade off the longest time to retrieve storage. Um, and that had started some very interesting things happening in the industry. Um, so since 2019, we've had some new products come into the marketplace with these providers. So AWS starting there again, introduced um, Glacier Instant Retrieval, which I'll talk about in just a second. And when they did that, they renamed what had been their one of their cold archival tiers, Glacier, to be Glacier Flexible Retrieval. So Glacier Instant Retrieval is interesting. It's a relatively new product, as I said, and it's really going against what had been the key differentiator for Google Cloud in the archive storage mix. Um, if you might recall from last time, Google Cloud's object-based storage, even though it has all those tiers that have different trade-offs and cost and performance, each one of Google Cloud's tiers is immediately available. So you can put something into back in 2019, Google Cloud Cold Line, and unlike Glacier, the competitor in AWS, you don't have to wait three to five hours for restore. Google Cloud Cold Line, if you request the content, it's immediately available to you. You have to pay an extra fee as if you were restoring it, but you don't have to wait. So Glacier introducing Glacier Instant Retrieval is in my mind really the the way that they're looking to differentiate and kind of take away any competitive advantage from those services that do provide instant availability of your archive content at a very competitive price. Um, Google Cloud has had some changes as well since 2019. Their cold line storage has gotten cheaper and they introduced a new, cheaper, deeper class of storage, archive storage. Again, I believe really looking at competing with the cheapest possible storage tier from Glacier Deep Archive. Uh, and while Microsoft Azure has the same storage tiers they had in 2019, they have also worked very hard to uh, rework their archive tier to make it much more competitive, uh, I think really in response to that Glacier Deep Archive. Um, so let's talk about what this means in terms of practicality and cost. Again, trying, this is the only slide with numbers, I swear, uh, trying not to, uh, to do too much on the numbers front. Um, but I just want to give you a sense of the high level cost we're looking at. So this first column is what it costs to store a terabyte, uh, 1000 gigabytes, a tibby byte, however you want to say, it, one terabyte for a whole year, and what it would cost to retrieve it and download it out of the cloud. Those are two separate fees you get charged, a retrieval fee to bring it back to online and make it available for you to do whatever you want to with it. You can analyze it, you can make a proxy of it, you could use it in the cloud. And then the second fee is if you wanna download it out of the cloud. So I'm combining those two fees, retrieval and egress or download into one, just to give you a sense of the scale of differences here. So this is storing the content for a whole year. This is downloading all of the content, that one terabyte, um, one time out of the cloud. So you could see there have been a lot of changes. The, the lines in new are red. Um, uh, those are the new products that got introduced. Um, and you can see the Google Cloud Archive and the Microsoft Azure Blob Archive with a 50% price decrease since we talked last time, really in the same class as AWS Glacier Deep Archive, working to compete for that lowest possible storage fee. Um, all of them have various fees if you need to restore and reuse all your content. Now, in reality, if your goal is to restore and reuse everything you put in the cloud on a regular basis and pull it all out of the cloud, then that's probably not the most effective way to set this up. Most of the time, if you have an archive in the cloud, you're only restoring and reusing a portion of it on a regular basis, which is why some of these economics tend to match up. Um, you can see the Glacier Instant tier really now competing with the Microsoft Cloud, or I'm sorry, 
the Google Cloud cold line tier. Those are very much equivalent instant retrieval, um, instant access to your content. Uh, the Google Cloud cold line has come down in price because of that uh, in a way to compete. Um, so lots of changes, lots of additions. Um, and my big takeaway from this is that while the lowest possible storage cost is getting cheaper, uh, the complexity of it all is getting higher. It's, it takes more to figure out exactly what the right use case is for you. And in order to make some of these cheapest possible storage offerings available, the cloud providers are starting to add in a few caveats like, oh, it's only available in this region, or it's only available in this situation, or other discount deals you might have don't apply to that cheapest possible storage. Everybody's really trying to drive a differentiator as that, that cheapest possible, the lowest possible cost. In order to do that effectively, you really have to navigate and understand and work with folks to understand when that rate applies and how it can apply to you and to your workflows. Uh, still feels a little bit like you're doing your taxes. I think I made that joke um, in 2019 to figure out exactly what you need to pay for your cloud providers going into it. Um, if anything, that complexity is going up. Um, all this being said, um, egress charges and the charges to bring things out of the cloud and the restore fees, those have generally stayed pretty solid. So people are competing on lower price. So far, I haven't seen people start to compete on uh, cheaper egress or differentiating themselves, at least among these three major cloud providers. There are a whole other universe of smaller cloud, cloud providers that try to compete on different fees. But with these three big ones, it's pretty much held the same on the egress front. So why would you want to deal with this? Why would you want to feel like you're doing your taxes uh, to simply get into the cloud storage and figure out how much it's going to cost? Um, uh, personally, I think there are tremendous opportunities on the other side of that if you do it right. And we've done some really interesting things at a and &E I'm, I'm excited to share um, that I think are some good examples of the types of opportunities that open up to you if you are effectively using the cloud as the source of your archive. Um, and really the key here is to think about media supply chain. Um, those are the types of things that enable the scale that the cloud gives us to work effectively. Uh, and a lot of the work we've done at a &E has been focused around reorienting our thinking around utilizing an effective media supply chain. So just to briefly review what that means, um, supply chain manufacturing uh, principles. They kind of come from old style, going back to the Henry Ford era, even of putting together complex things like a car. You have raw materials coming in one end, people apply a process to them. And at the other end, you have an output, you have a finished good, you have a thing people want. Um, and so that principle applies to a lot of things and uh, I think can apply quite well to some of the work we do in media getting our content where it needs to go. We're taking in these raw files or feeds or old tapes that are being digitized of television programs. Um, we're applying processes to them, like reviewing them and quality checking them and editing them, adding captions, adding annotations, putting in new subtitles, making sure the content is ready. And then we distribute them. We distribute them lots of different places. Um, you know, uh, they can go to a cable television or a broadcast television, playback head end. They can go to many different digital outputs and of course can go to an archive. So thinking about what you do as a supply chain allows you to approach it differently and leverage some of the power you get from these cloud-based tools. So over the last few years, this is where A&E has gotten to in our cloud-based journey. Um, we have, we've gotten to the point where everything new is coming in the cloud except for some videotapes. We still have some videotapes and we basically digitize the videotapes and get them into the cloud after that. But I haven't figured out a way to take a physical tape and you know just put it in the cloud. You know There, there are services that will help with that, but um, at the end of the day, you still need to put that physical object through a digitization process. But everything new arrives in the cloud. All of our reviewing, annotation, um, updating processes are done in the cloud. Um, our editing is moving into the cloud right now. That's a big project for us to get more cloud-based editing. We already have a little bit over the line into the cloud where we're reversioning and making new things. Um, and then on the archive side, I really want to point to we're, we're moving our linear playback systems and a lot of our digital distribution is coming out of the cloud. 
um, to big providers like the Netflix and the Hulus and the, the pluses of the world. Um, but the really thing I want to point to is this archive is in the cloud. Everything new we make ends up being archived in the cloud. And that's enabled some really interesting things for us in terms of scale. Um, so here's a, here's a chart that um, I've tried to anonymize so it may or may not make too much sense. But at a high level, people have started to call up and say, hey, we would like a large volume of television episodes from you in a short amount of time. Um, and the cloud has enabled us to do that. I, I think I talked a little bit back at the World Conference about a deal a &E had made with a large streaming provider to provide a large amount of content for their launch. Um, and at the time, we took what would have been, by all estimates, 60 to 90 days of manual work for a team, clicking buttons, filling out forms, and uploading files, and turned that into about 12 hours worth of automation that ran overnight and delivered those thousands of things where they needed to go. Um, and that was the first run of that, but we have done that many, many times now. People call up and say, hey, can you send me uh, 2,000 episodes of television and movies, 5,000, 6,000, 8,000, 15,000 episodes of television. Um, and we're able to make that work because we have the scale of the cloud to leverage with the approach of a media supply chain. Um, th there are things here like this chart um, happens to show our largest delivery week where we delivered about 10,000 episodes of television. Um, and in order to get this done in, I happen to know this got done in about two days, even though this chart is every week, um, we were processing about a petabyte of content from our master library to get it out where it needed to go that week. Um, and I just don't know how to do that without the cloud. I, I don't know how to do that without the scale that you get from having essentially unlimited processing power opening up to you as you need it. Um, so it's enabled some really interesting things to happen um, that I think can open up a ton of opportunities for libraries and archives to be used in new ways on new platforms in short, short amounts of time. Um, so like I mentioned though, going to the cloud really isn't enough to just say, you can't just say I'm in the cloud, I'm done. You know, I moved all my stuff, I'm good. Um, it's about a strategy, it's about a process. And these are three key things I tend to keep in mind that have helped me. Um, first and foremost, I, I mentioned automation a couple times and really it's important to automate what you can, even if it's a simple task, like having somebody approve a delivery before it leaves. Um, if you need to have somebody click that checkbox, you know, 5,000 times for 5,000 deliveries, you can only click so fast. Um, you really need to remove the manual touch points that don't add value and focus on automating what you can. Um, then of course, the second piece, this should be of no surprise to anybody that um, knowing the truth is extremely important. Having very good unassailable metadata, you know exactly what file is what, you know exactly what its audio tracks are, you know what languages you have for it, you know where the content starts and stops by time code. Having really good metadata is the fuel that makes this automation possible. Just can't do it without it. I know that's that's definitely not a surprise to anybody here. Um, and the last thing I'll say is flow over function. That um, when you think about what you're doing as a supply chain and you think about all of the steps, it might be easy to zoom in on one of the steps or many of the steps individually and try to make each of the steps as effective as possible. Go in, we had a, a project where we had an editing process. We applied some artificial intelligence to it. And we were able to cut the editing time by 50%. The editors could do twice as much, which is great. Um, but I find that's relatively unusual to get that kind of improvement over improving a single process in the chain. And there's more to do. The real improvements, the scaling to thousands of things improvements come from thinking about the flow, thinking about the process from end to end, thinking about how the steps go together and connect together. Are they in the right order? Do all the steps even need to happen at all? When you think about the flow, I think you're really able to enable some very interesting things that you wouldn't be able to do had you just focused on the individual steps. Um, so I know I'm at time and I will just uh, leave you with a closing thought that um, uh, looking forward, I think we're gonna see the world move faster. I think we're gonna see things continue to grow and change. I think we're gonna see demands for scale. 
Um, and this last uh, graphic, which I think I first showed in 2017, uh, continues to be something that I think about where we are in a exponential world where technology is growing very quickly. Um, and it continues to surprise us, it continues to surprise us every time. You think things are, you think you got it handled and then a new thing comes along and it's like, wow, that is a, that is an exponential growth problem. And now we need to deal with that. Um, so I would say the way that I have worked through this is to find tools that are useful to learn them well and to work on a mentality of always trying to learn and love and build new tools. Um, staying ahead of the curve, thinking about what you're doing in, an, in a way that accounts for the fact that we're all going to continue to be surprised by whatever the next thing is that comes our way. So, so with that, I thank you so much. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here with you all. Um, I am sorry that I, I may not be able to stick around for all the questions at the end, but I know I will uh, get them and be sure to respond. And I'm very looking forward to hopefully seeing you all again in person someday, not too long from now. Thank you. And thank you very much, Dave. It's, um, I think it's very interesting for archives, uh, especially that since you see that even in the MMC surveys, uh, uh, that, that check each year uh, where we are as archives with annotation and uh, also cloud-based uh, workflows, you saw that uh, a lot of years cloud-based was really a step too far, but you see that it's really moving now. So it's uh, really interesting there. But thank you very much, and um, we are sure to get uh, back at you with the questions uh, later on. Thank you.